Genetics really is a topic that, that caters to all of those logistic learners out there that likes to find out why things are the way they are. And that's what pretty much drove Mandel to figure all we're going to talk about in this video out. But before we do that, I want to remind you that he actually studies seven traits. Uh, each of those traits with uh, two, uh, he's having characters, sorry. And each of those characters with, with two different traits for that character which is cool about the pea plants. They have very discrete, simple to analyze characters. So you see it's shape, seed shape colors, pod shape, pod color, seed coat color, flower position, flower height, and flower color, which could be these variations that you see in the screen. And there's the dominant and the recessive versions of the alu. Now I want to take this opportunity to explain how you actually come up with this system of, of, of naming the alu. So basically it's very simple to, uh, to the very first alu to be discovered is the letter that you use so for example if the very now in this here it's actually i can't really show you that here because all of them since the dominant was so common it was the very first one that mendel saw so he called the seed shape the wild type or the regular the one that was always seen he called that big r so that means r is for round because round was discovered first but what if wrinkled was discovered first? Then instead of using R, he would have used W, right? So just to keep that in mind. Now, what about if uh, the capital versus lowercase? Typically, we use capitalized letters first and then lowercase letters second. So that means you're always going to put the dominant first. So if the genotype is heterozygous, where you get the, the, the mixture, like we talked in the previous uh, thing, you're going to get big R, little r. You don't write little r, big r. By convention, you always write the big R first. Okay? Also, the little r is the underscore or the underline, or sorry, the not capitalized or the regular is always lowercase, always meaning recessive, while the big R always means the dominant. So let me give you an example and see if you can figure this out. You can pause the video after I ask the question and see if you can figure it out before I actually do it. All right, so if you're doing uh, um, color of cat's eyes, and there's two colors, red and brown, and brown was discovered first, which letter are you going to use to determine the trait? You should have said B for brown because brown was discovered first. Now, if red is dominant over brown, which what what is big B going to mean? What is big B and what is little b? Even though big B makes you think of saying brown, no. Brown is the recessive look, and so that would be lowercase brown. All right? And then the, the other one would be red even so th what i'm trying to give you a show you with that example is that the letter that's used for the code has nothing to do with the letter that represents the dominant you tell which one is dominant by telling which one is capital the letter that's used depends on the le on the or which trait was discovered first all right so i hope that's clear now in this is not going to be an issue in the punished squares that we're doing because all of the Mendel's punished squares, the dominant was the one that was discovered first. So the big Y is always, uh, the big ones are always the dominant ones in these examples, but it doesn't have to be that way, and I wanted to make that clear. Now, Mendel's first cross, what well, the first thing he's going to be doing is discover, his, eventually, by the way, he's going to be creating true breeders. Now, we're going to talk about that in a second. But before we do that, I want to start by saying that the end result, I know that I'm getting starting with the end, it makes no sense, but the end result of Mendel's work was two laws. Now, I wanted to make clear that the reason I'm starting this way is because as we discuss the, 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 the crosses, I want you to spot those laws. And so that's what I'm going to talk about first. Now, the end result of his work, work was to get to these laws. Now, some people say that the law of dominance is a law of, of Mendel. That's not actually true. He never, ever, never actually called it a law. Uh, he just said that one gene always takes over the other. So the law of dominance basically states that when two genes meet, the one that's dominant will always show. And basically that means that the, if the dominant gene, if present, will be shown, which explains why the heterozygous and the homozygous dominant look 
both show that. And if I say these words and you don't understand what they are, you need to study and memorize them because you need to know really well what I mean by homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. But either way, both of those will look dominant because they have a dominant. So if the dominant is present, it always shows. And the law of dominance will also state that the recessive look will only show if the recessive is by itself or paired with another recessive. That's right. It is possible for genes to be by themselves. We'll talk about that later. But normally, genes are paired up. And in order for the recessive to show, it can only be paired up with another one just like it. So that means it needs to be little r, little r in order to be white. If you're big r, little r, even though you have the little r, you're going to be red because you have a dominant, and the dominant always shows if present. Now, that's not actually one of Mendel's laws, even though it's something that he actually coined and explained. He never actually called it a law, although so later on, we call that a law, or law of dominance. Another law that Mendel came up with is the law of segregation, or the idea that during the process of the, of, of the creation of a new entity, of a new organism, from two parents, the pieces of genetic code which are in the parent, because each parent has two, and Mendel figured that out. Even before he understood, even, he didn't ever saw chromosomes, he never saw that they were homologs, he never saw genes, but he knew that there had to be two. He knew that it had to be paired. And he's figured out, basically, by doing his thing, and we're going to see why in a second, uh, that there had to be two, and that the, the code was determined of these two, one from mom, one from that, right? And that the thing is, though, that when you have your child, you're going to separate those things to different gametes. In other words, one gamete is going to get your mom's version, and one gamete is going to get your dad's version of the, of the genes. And so, remember, though, from meiosis, that because of crossing over, no chromosome actually has pure mom or pure dad. So, for example, let's say you get the, the, these two chromosomes here, and they're the same, right, for that specific gene. I, so, just reviewing what we did with Mayos, because of crossing over, because of crossing over, if you have two chromosomes of the same type, the red one came from mom, the black one from, came from dad, but remember the way doing prophase one, they're going to cross over. And so, what does that mean? It means that a pieces from the dad are going to end up in the mom's chromosome and vice versa, which basically mean that the, even if you separate them, which happens during end of phase one, and one goes one way and the other one goes another, this will go to one gamete, this will go to the other gamete, and they will separate. When they separate, they take with them pieces of the other chromosome. So you never donate just your mom or just your dad to your child because... The chromosomes that you give to the gamete that end up winning are always going to have a mixture of both chromosomes in it. And not only that, since we have 46 chromosomes in 23 different types, so let's say you have 23 different types of chromosome, and the left side represents mom, the right side represents dad, all right? So the left side represents mom, the right side represents dad. So you have different types of chromosomes. So this one is chromosome type 1, this one is chromosome type 2, and you see that in the board. That Now, what I'm trying to tell you here is that when separation of the homologs happens, and I talked about this in the, in the hemiosis lecture, chances are this chromosome will go to the gamete, but then when, the, other ga when the, ga the second chromosome comes, this one is, is going to go there. And then chances are, therefore, that that one goes to the, the gamete and that, that one goes to the, the gamete which means that you will get, for type 1, you get well, this gamete on the left side got moms, but for type 2, it got dads. And since this, this is randomly, uh, what that means is that you will never, ever make a gamete that is just like mom or just like dad, or basically you are going to give a mixture of mom and dad to the gamete that ends up winning. And, and then when you add both things, crossing over and separation of homologs, that's what creates the variation. And then more variation even because you make thousands of gametes throughout your life and it's random which one of those gametes actually ends up making a child. 
And so it is a lot of random things that end up deciding what you actually give to your child, which creates this randomization process. Now, this is just a review of what we talked about in meiosis, but why is that important? It's important because even if you have a bad gene inside of you, so let's give an example of that. Let's say if you have a big X and then you have a little X, but little X is deadly. But because you have the big S, you're not dead. Because remember, in, the only way a recessive gene is deadly is if you have two of those. So if you were like that, you wouldn't even be alive. You would die. But since you have a big gene, you show the dominant look, and the dominant look is okay. So you live. So when you're going to give that to your child, because of this randomization, it's still possible to give to your child a good gene. And that's what's interesting about this, that because of the randomization, you don't necessarily have to damage your child. And so and that's another thing that's interesting. And then also, because you're going to combine your genes with the genes of your mom, let's say there is a sickness that's not deadly, but it's a bad sickness. You don't want to have it. Let's say like something like color blindness, and it's a recessive trait. And so let's say you have that recessive trait, and then your, your, the, your mate does not have the recessive trait. So you're colorblind, but she's not. When you make a cross and you combine these chromosomes, the only possible combination, and we're going to learn about that in the next video, is a big C, little c, because she can only give a big C, and you can only give little c, and so that's the only possible child you guys can make. But that means that child is not going to be called Brian because she has a big C, which protects her from the recessive look that only shows if by itself, or paired up with another one like it. So... Genetic variation in combination and sexual reproduction creates all of these advantages. And we talked about this when we do the evolution of sex later in the year. Now, why am I talking all about all of this if it's, all of this was discovered way after Mandel? Because of what I want you to understand is that when the genes are made, they actually separate. Separation of the homologs and, and crossing over is actually separating these genes and shuffling them around. And that... Later, those genes recombine to form the zygote that makes the new organism. So that Mendel has what is called the law of segregation, or the idea that genes separate and recombine later in different ways, which creates variation, but that they do not blend together. Genes are separate, and they separate during sexual reproduction where the gametes are being made. And even when they combine doing fertilization, they remain separate and talk separately to each, from each other. That is the law of segregation, that gametes separate. And you see that here, that there are equal chances that each gamete, each gene is going to end up in each gamete because of this random shuffling around of the genes. And that we now understand that this is tied to the process of meiosis. And that is what I was trying to explain with this video. Another thing that Mendel discovered and that when genes separate, um, the way that your eye color separates and the way that your intelligence separates have nothing to do with each other. If there is a genetic component for intelligence and there is a genetic component for eye color, those characters and are not they have nothing to do with each other. In other words, just because you have intelligence, it doesn't mean you're going to have a certain eye color. Or just because you have a certain eye color, it doesn't mean you're going to get a certain intelligence. Be, which so what, the, what Mendel figured out is that genes segregate independently from each other. Now, in the next video, when we actually do Mendel's crosses, we're going to talk about these laws of dominance, segregation, and independent assortment. And so I wanted to start talking about them so you can have them in your head as we talk about the crosses. I'll see you in the next video.